Welcome back to my video series on automating your network devices using the power and simplicity of Python and NetMiko. We're going to start with our existing script that we have here. Currently, it runs a single command against multiple devices that have been read in from an input file called devices.json. We want to expand the script to read in a list of commands from a file and run those commands against multiple devices. We also want to modify the script so that we can specify our input files at the command line, such that we can call the script and give a file name for our list of commands and another file name for our list of devices. So let's get started. I went ahead and created two new files. Here are my router commands, or commands I would run against my layer 3 devices, and here are my switch commands. These are commands that are more appropriate for my layer 2 devices. I've also divided our set of devices by the same categories. Here are the set of routers in the routers.json file and the switches in the switches.json file. So when we run our script, we can have it run the router commands against our layer 3 devices and then use the same script to run our switch commands against our layer 2 devices. First thing we need to learn is how to get our script to read command line arguments. And for that, we're going to use the sys module. And to demonstrate how this works, I'm going to add an exit to my code, which literally tells Python to exit and not run any of the code below it. And we'll put some experimental commands in here before the exit to see how this works. SysArgv is the variable that references a list of all the command line arguments that have been passed to Python. Let's go ahead and save that. And you see the first time I run the script without any command line arguments, the argument list has a length of one and we see a list with only a single element in it, which happens to be the name of the script. This is what's getting passed to Python, a list of one argument being the name of the script to execute. If I add my first command line argument, I now have two arguments in the sysargv list. I have the script name and the first argument. And so on. We now have a list of three arguments. Script name, first argument, second argument. This is very useful because the way we want to run the script is by specifying a list of commands and the list of devices that we want to run these commands against. So our list of commands is going to be sysargv1 and our devices will be sysargv2 since the script name is at index 0. And we'll need to verify that we have at least three elements in sysargv. So now if the script receives less than three arguments, it will print a usage message and exit. Otherwise, it should continue running. Let's verify that. Excellent. It printed our usage statement as we expected. Let's copy this line. So now we're accepting sys.argv1 as the name of our commands file, and we'll open the file here. And we'll use the read lines method to automatically split this file into a list. So what we get out of this is a list where each command is a separate element in that list. And later we can iterate over this list. And we'll use sysargv2 to get our devices. Since these will be temporary lines of code, purely intended for verifying the functionality, I like to add these ugly hash marks to remind me to rip these out later. Let's test this. We know it exits if I don't supply enough arguments. I'm going to break out of this. I use the control C keystroke to break out of this. I want to point out that here we see the commands and we see that each command is its own element in this list 
And now we see we have a list of devices, where each device in the list is represented by a dictionary. Notice that when I hit Control C, we got a trace back, which is just ugly. It's saying there was a keyboard interrupt, and that's why it stopped running the script. I know. I hit the Control C, and I don't need to see it dump all this rubbish on the screen. So I have a fix for that. What I'm going to do is cut and paste some code into here. First, I'm importing the signal module, which lets me capture and handle signals passed from the operating system. SIGINT captures our control C keystroke, and this one is intended to handle a broken pipe. So if we're piping the output of the script into some utility, such as head, head would send a signal back to the program that is sending the data, which is our script, telling our script that it's had enough and it won't take anymore. That will create an IO error traceback, which we also want to avoid. So now when our script sees one of these signals, it's going to silently exit. So this is code that I've added to many of my scripts so that it doesn't look like I've hit some massive error under what is actually normal circumstances. So let's do a quick demo without using signal and then by adding signal back in. Okay, so I've hit control C here and we get a keyboard interrupt and we don't want to get a trace back when that happens. Secondly, I might want to pipe this into a command like grep and I'll ask grep to give me, say, only the first five matches of dynamic. So in this case, the output of our script is getting piped over to our grep command. And I told grep only match the first five of these. I don't want to see any more than that. And when grep completed, it sends a message back up the pipe telling our script that it's not listening anymore. Same thing happens with the head command which gives us the first 10 lines of output. So the fix is to use these signals to catch these events and exit silently. Now let's see the difference when we use signals. Now we don't get that ugly error when our script closes. When the downstream command sends the get lost signal back up to the script, it exits nicely. What about when we hit control C? Again, I hit control C, we break out, this time with no ugly traceback. So let's go ahead and remove these commands. I'll hit control S to save the file. And of course we have these commands here, but we're not doing anything with them. So once we've created a connection to our device, we'll want to run our commands. So it's simple enough to add a for loop to iterate over the commands, assigning each one to command, and we'll send the command to our connected device. But let's add a little more here. Let's save it and try running it. Okay, that worked quite nicely. It sent to our two devices and ran our command. And notice how each section is separated by this output of command. But rather than have the scroll past our screen, we probably want to send the output to a file. So when we save this output to a file, we want to name the file based on the device. And while we know the IP address of the device, I prefer to save it to a file based on the host name of the device. So where can we get the host name? I'm glad you asked. Let's create a connection to NetMiko and explore the object properties. All right, here's our connection. I know the prompt on my routers is the device host name, so let's see where NetMiko keeps the prompt. I believe base prompt is the attribute that includes the host name. It's class string. Let's see what it is. Perfect. It's the host name of the device we're connected to. So let's create a file. We need a file name. We need to open it with the right axis.
Instead of printing it, we'll write it to the file. It's important to note here that unlike the print function that appends a new line, the write method does not, and we'll need to include that ourselves. By adding two new lines, we get a second blank line after this. Let's save that and test it. Okay, we see now we have two extra files here, switch one and switch two. If I look at the file, we have our show interface status, show MAC address table, show VLAN, and we can easily see which section is which command. Instead of making one big file with all our command output, we might want to separate the command output into separate files. For example, if we wanted a script to go through this and parse the data, it would first need to separate each section, which is doable, but maybe not ideal. We might find it more convenient to separate each command output into its own file and create a directory named for the device, and then keep all the command output files in the directory for that device. So let's do that. To create the directory, we need to load the OS module. You might notice, for the most part, I keep these in alphabetical order. We want to create a directory with the base prompt name. Let's store that in NewDir. And we'll call OS MakeDir to make the target directory for us. Then we need to create a new file for each command. So we need to move this line into the for loop. So for the file name, I'm going to base it on the command, and I'll use replace, which is a string method. We want to replace all these spaces with underscores. It's important to remember that strings are immutable, so we are not actually changing this string called command. We're actually creating a new object that is a modified version of the command string, with all the spaces replaced by underscores. And we'll append the dot text to the string, and then assign this new object to file name. We want that to be stored in the new directory we just created, so we need to prepend the directory name along with a forward slash. The join method expects a single iterable object such as a list or a tuple, so we need to add the second set of parentheses around new dir and file name to wrap them up and present them as a tuple. We don't need to add the header into the file. We only need a single new line at the end, as there won't be any more text written into this file. Alright, so let's save this and run it. Now you see we have two directories, and each has some files in it, one file for every command we ran. Okay, so we see this file is show MAC address table dot text. And no surprise inside, it's the MAC address table. I hope you find this useful. I welcome your feedback and hope you join me for my next video in this series. Until then, happy scripting.